What happens with objects at rest? They stay at rest. But what about objects in motion? They keep moving. Action, reaction. In a world where everything is in motion, with your data at rest, your customer experiences, your ambitions, your business itself will stay at rest. Set that data in motion. And every impulse, every action triggers instant reaction across every experience, every app, every system across your entire business. Tap into a continuous stream of data in ever-flowing nervous system that unlocks those real-time insights that are only insightful because they're real-time. The world doesn't wait. The world moves. And your data needs to move too. Please welcome back Danica Fine and Chris Jenkins. All right, everyone. Good morning. It is day two of Current. How are we all feeling? All right. Come on. Enthusiasm. We're all excited, especially after last night, right? All right. How are you feeling? I'm feeling really good. <laughs> I really enjoyed the after party last night. Oh. I may be feeling a teensy bit fragile. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, as far as conference after parties go, I feel like that was, that was pretty good, right? How many of you went? Yeah? Spoon! Wonderful spoon! So good. <laughs> All right, Chris, come on, take it seriously. We've sorry, got, sorry. We've got work to do. Clark Kent. Turn back into Clark Kent. Yeah, All right, all yeah, right, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Remind me, what are we doing today? Well, okay, we're, right now we're doing a keynote. Okay, yeah, we'll, sorry. We'll yeah. get to that. But oh. yes, we're here to kick off the last keynote of Current. Uh, we're kicking off the final day, the second day of Current. It's a little bittersweet, right? The beginning yeah, of the end. Yeah, it's, it's sad, but it's also happy. Yeah, a little bit. So there are still a lot of great things on the agenda today. We have a lot of great breakout sessions and so many wonderful sessions happening at the Meetup Hub. So again, check that conference app and go and rate those sessions. Yeah. Oh, can, I, can I plug my session? Chris, this is not the time. OK, that is shameless self-promotion, folks. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry about that. Come on, as a reasonable human, I cannot let you do that. That's fair. All right? But as a fellow developer advocate, absolutely, Chris, do it. Thank you do very it. much. So let me plug this session. We thought a nice way to end the conference would be a little bit of a panel discussion, a debate. We've got some great people who you may know coming in to debate something with us. We've got Addy Polak of LakeFS, Eric Sammer of Decodable, uh, Tyler Arkido of Snowflake, and Amy Chen of DBT Labs. And we will be discussing the question of the day. Is streaming really the future? Or will there always be a place for batch? Ah, the age-old question. Age-old question that's mm -hmm. brand new. That will be in Ballroom E at 4 p.m. I hope you will join us. Absolutely, adding that to Was that okay for a bit of shameless self-promotion? Absolutely, and speaking of shameless ways to insert yourself into the conversation, I think it's time for that final keynote streaming selfie. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Remember when you take them, do post them to social media with the hashtag current22. Networking is real work, right? You don't have to tell me twice, Chris. Yeah, so let everybody know how hard you're working to make this conference great. Absolutely, and speaking of people that work hard to build great things, here with the latest on the great things we're building at Confluent, we have the one, the only, Chad Rubowski. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to day two of Current. I am so excited to be here with you today. What we're gonna do this morning is talk about how Confluent has reimagined data pipelines for the streaming era. And we're also going to introduce to you some of the exciting new features we've added to Confluent Cloud. We're also going to hear from one of our customers and close partner, New Relic, who's been working with Kafka in real-time data at massive scale. They also partner with us to help operate our Confluent Cloud. But first, what I'd like to do is recap some of the messages that we've heard yesterday to set the stage for the innovations we're working on at Confluent. We heard from Jay, who described how we've entered the streaming era because businesses need to work with their data in motion rather than just processing their data at rest, because that's just not fast enough. 
There's been some remarkable innovation in this space, and an entire ecosystem has sprouted up with what is needed to enable all businesses to become real time. June described to us how Kafka has become the center of the streaming ecosystem. It's growing at an incredibly massive rate. We also see that Kafka is still one of the most popular Apache Kafka projects ever. There's hundreds of thousands of organizations using it globally, and it has a robust community of committers that are innovating and driving this project forward. So what's driving this growth in Kafka and the ecosystem? Well, it's this huge set of real-time use cases. And while these use cases are varied, they can be bucketed into two broad categories. On one hand, we have data pipelines, moving data between databases, data warehouses, data lakes, and a bunch of other sources. On the other hand, you have data applications that are triggering actions based on real-time events, such as the fraud detection that protects us when we use our credit cards. Today, we're going to focus on the former. We're going to talk about the data pipelines that businesses are struggling to move and share data with in a seamless way as they start to migrate these to become real time. Now in the past, data pipelines played a pretty simple role. They would extract data from operational databases and from some logs. They transform this data, load it into a data warehouse where it could be used for analytics and reporting. And because there was relatively few sources of this data and sinks, the cycle times for producing these things was maybe on the order of days or weeks or maybe even months. Building a pipeline was a pretty straightforward activity. And despite the critical place that they play in our business systems, they're just not good enough for today because they're not quick enough. Also, because of the growing number of sources that we have, the variety of formats that our data lives in, and this increase in the number of destinations for where our data needs to go to, we're simply left with a web of point-to-point -point systems that are very difficult to scale and maintain, especially as we move into this world of real-time data processing. I'd like to give you an example about this. So one of our customers, which is a large multinational apparel company, before they joined Confluent, they actually had hundreds of engineers working on building these data pipelines using these traditional data processing methods. And that's not a great place to be. If you're an apparel company, you want to be spending your resources on building apparel, not managing infrastructure. So as we thought about this, we came up with five challenges that we think traditional data pipelines fall victim to that help create this mess. The first one that we've been talking about a lot is really that batch needs to become real time. The second problem is that the centralization of all of your data just isn't working out because you need data in multiple sources. The third problem is that these tools lack the governance capabilities that you need to be able to protect your data if you're going to share it with everybody that can make use of it. And the fourth problem is that the developers today have to manage the infrastructure that's running these pipelines. The fifth problem is that the tools that we're using to build them are simply inflexible. They need to fit into the open ecosystem and the evolution of the development environment that you already have. Now, what I'd like to do is explain what I mean by each of these and show you how Confluent is working to solve them. The first challenge is that batch. All of the data that you're working with is coming through, and you have to extract it in a batch. You have to transform it in a batch. You have to load it in a batch. So I'd like to bring this to life by describing it through a few problems with examples. So first, if you're a retailer, you have to make a purchase decision. Would you be comfortable doing that with a week old of data? Or if you're a financial investor and you had to make a bank trade, how effective do you think that trade would be with our old data? Well, of course, not very effective. And just like you, if there was a busy street, I probably wouldn't want to cross that street with a five-minute view of where the traffic is. In every scenario, real time is better than stale data. Fast is better than slow. 
And of course, now is better than later. And that's why our first principle for data pipelines has to be that streaming is better than batch. And this probably isn't controversial for this audience here today. Data continues to flow and evolve in real time, and it needs a mirror of how this should work with your extraction, transformation, and loading operations. Kafka provides the basis for that. You can move your data as it's generated, and you're not waiting for minutes, hours, or days. And Confluent makes this simpler because we've completed Kafka with an entire ecosystem of connectors that allow you to talk to any of the applications and systems in your environment. The second challenge is that traditional data pipeline tools treat this centralized data warehouse as the final resting place for all of your data. And this just inhibits access to any of the folks that need to work with it in other lates. Now, before Confluent, I spent a number of years running engineering for BigQuery, which is a major data warehouse at Google. So nobody loves a data warehouse more than me. But the reality is the number of sources of this data is growing massively. And each of them has their own domain and their own schema that's evolving on its own. So if all this data, all the cleaning, all the processing and preparation is owned by a central team, this creates a bottleneck. Lots of time is needed for somebody else to figure out what all these things are, how to correlate them together before they can be available to others. And this simply reduces the amount of people that can get access to data because of that bottleneck, and it just takes longer to make that available so that others can use it. What we need instead is a decentralized pattern where we can decouple the sources of this data from the people that are consuming it. So data owned and lives closer to the people that are producing it. And Kafka is designed and well suited to this. Teams familiar with the domain are producing data that's available for everybody else in topics. And others can then easily discover and access as they need, just like a search engine on the internet. Those streams can easily be reshaped and reused in multiple different contexts. Now with that said, you're probably thinking, there is probably a good reason that self-service isn't the norm today. Is it because data is hard to discover? Is it because you can't trust the quality of data because you don't know where it came from? Or is it just the scale of trying to apply the security policies to protect your data at the massive scale of data volumes that you have? Well, thinking about this, I believe that organizations really have two competing pressures. On one side is making your data broadly available so everybody can use it and you get the most results. The other side is making sure that you respect the trust of your users and your business by protecting it so that it doesn't get into the wrong hands or it's used in an inappropriate way. Now, I believe that these imperatives are not mutually exclusive. And the problem ultimately stems from the governance not being baked into the infrastructure and the streaming processing systems that need to respect those policies. Confluent has invested significantly in stream governance to solve this for Kafka. And we think about stream governance really in these three principles. The first one is stream quality. And with that, we've built schema registry, which enforces this schema and all of the data that's being produced. And this allows you to evolve your schemas without breaking any data flows. The next is streaming catalog. As you're producing volumes of streams, you need some way to present this for discovery by everybody in your organization so that it can be widely used. And last is stream lineage, which helps you understand your data pipeline flow in visual form so that everybody can see how that data was processed and not just the data itself, but where did that data come from so that debugging and troubleshooting is extremely easy. Combined, these features free you from the trade-off of trying to protect your data and making it broadly available. You get the boast of both worlds, so you can have your cake and eat it too. Now, you need more than stream governance for decentralization. You need your data pipeline tools to be simple, approachable, so teams can reshape all of the data in your organization to do whatever they need. So imagine. 
If I always happened to need to fly from Austin to San Francisco, and the airline asked me as I was buying my ticket, hey, how much fuel do you think you need, Chad, for yourself and all of your baggage? What altitude do you think we need to fly at? And uh, when we get there, what do you think is the right runway we should land on? I mean, I wouldn't want to make on those kind of responsibility of figuring out those levels of details for uh, what should be a very simple task. But the reality is we accept that kind of responsibility when we're working with traditional data pipeline tools to build an ETL uh, application. Instead, the right platform for data pipelines needs to decouple the transformation logic from the details of how it's getting implemented. And for this, we need a declarative interface where you only need to describe the flow, the data sources that are coming in, what you need to do with it, and then where it needs to go. The infrastructure should automatically flex and figure out where is that data stored, what is the amount of cores, what is the amount of logic that you need to provision and resources to make that happen. And we believe that SQL is the right abstraction to do this. SQL has become pervasive in the data and the analytics industry, and so it's well-suited and well-understood for this task. A major focus of ours is to provide this declarative interface for stream processing. And that's why we have KSQL, which allows you to build each element in a data pipeline, sources, transformations, sinks, all seamlessly in SQL. It keeps you focused on what needs to happen and not how it happens underneath. And the rest is simply abstracted and taken away. The other advantage of SQL is that it's code. And this brings us to our final challenge, which is that traditional database tools are just inflexible. Modern tools, they don't always have this problem, but a lot of legacy tools suffer if they've just got this drag and drop interface. You know, and the simplicity of these visual tools comes at a cost. It may not support some of the complex logic that you need. And most significantly, this is kind of hidden behind that UI. So when you need to extend it, you're stuck. There's not a way to get it to do what you need to do in all your scenarios. And this also, because there's just that visual representation, it makes it impossible to integrate with all the tools you need in your development environment to be able to revolve your data pipelines. Things like CI, CD, version control, and testing. The most important thing is, we think there's a couple things that you can do better. The first is that everybody should be able to work with the tool of their choice. There might be a task that you just need to get done. It's simple. Let's use the GUI and just get it over with. The other thing is, you might need more finesse. Perhaps there's a lot more nuance to what you need to happen. And you can very quickly jump down and do that with SQL. Or maybe there's some other custom tools that you find most compelling to use. Any tool that you use. GUI or not, needs to fit into your existing tool chain. Developer workflows were well established for a reason, enabling code to change and improve over time. And we don't want to disrupt that. Data pipelines need to evolve. So making sure that they fit into these open and easy to use uh, development environments is essential. So to sum up, we think that there are these five principles for significantly reimagining how data pipelines should be built in real time. The first is that batch is not nearly as good as streaming. This centralized approach that creates a bottleneck needs to move to a decentralized approach. And of course, your ungoverned data should become governed so that you have the trust as you've shared it with everybody. And there's no need to manage infrastructure. That should go away, and you just declaratively specify what you need to happen, and the infrastructure does that in the most efficient and most optimal way. And finally, you need your tooling to move from being inflexible and just fitting in with how your developers are doing their work today. And this reinvention started with the advent of Kafka, and the reality is that over time, we've extended this with connectors, with KSQL, and with streaming governance. Now, perhaps we're in early innings here. There's obviously more that we need to do, and we're on it. 
But what I'd like to do is introduce you to some of those new capabilities that we've added to Confluent Cloud based on our conversations with customers. And what they told us is basically two things. First, we need to make it even simpler for people to build streaming data pipelines. We need to democratize the world of streaming so that every developer can quickly and easily work with this. And the second, we need even more expansive governance for streaming to make it easy for us to trust that that data is landing to everybody that needs it, but never in the wrong hands. And with that, I'd like to invite Greg DeMichelli to the stage, who's going to talk to us about some exciting new features that we've added to Confluent Cloud. Thanks, Chad. Appreciate that. Um, for the next 15 or 20 minutes, I have the coolest job in Austin. There's no debate about that, because I get to show you some of the newest features of Confluent Cloud. Uh, and so we're going to not just talk, though, because I know a bunch of you are developers out there, and you want to see some live demos. So at a certain point, I'm going to bring Megal up, and she and I are going to show you some products live on stage. So hopefully we've appeased the demos gods, and everything will go smoothly when we get to that point. Let me start with that theme that Chad talked about of democratization of data. Um, and you might ask, why is this an important thing? There's 2,000 people here in Austin who, who know Kafka, who love Kafka. Well, the fact is that as great as it is to have thousands of people here, if streaming data is going to achieve what I think we all hope it does, we need hundreds of thousands of developers able to build pipelines. So we need to make it available to more people. But even as a developer, I know for myself, I get tired of boilerplate sometimes, right? That same text you write over and over and over again, and 99 times you get it right, and one time you don't. And so we also think that with good tooling, we can make developers' lives easier by keeping them from having to muck around with the boilerplate. And those are the two things that we had in mind when we built Stream Designer. Today at this show, we're introducing Stream Designer, the visual builder for streaming data pipelines. This is the first UI that allows you to build, test, and deploy pipelines on Kafka. It leverages all the set of capabilities that we have in Confluent Cloud, from connectors to KSQL, topics. It gives you this cool end-to-end -end bird's eye view of your pipeline, so you can see all of the steps and all of the transformations. And as we'll talk about, it doesn't box you in. It doesn't limit you from accessing the full capability. So let me take those things, each of those one by one. Start with building streaming data pipelines. It's a point and click interface. It allows you to drag and drop connectors. It gives you the access to the full portfolio of transformations. So you can do filtering, mapping, joining, aggregating, rekeying. And it has built in alerts and validation. So if you've misconfigured an element, you see it in the tool before you go and actually put it into production. It also addresses one of the common problems with tools. One of the things when you talk to developers, why don't you like visual tools, most of them introduce an additional runtime layer. The tool is great, but now there's this extra piece of runtime that slows my application down. That's not true with Stream Designer. Stream Designer natively works by reading and writing and editing KSQL. That means that built into the tool, you have the ability to see the KSQL that's being generated. And it's not just a read-only view. You actually can go to the KSQL, and if you want to edit code, maybe. Maybe you want to copy and paste some code from Stack Overflow. Who here codes via Stack Overflow? Yeah. Um, this gives you the tool to round trip from text back into the user interface. And because it's built on KSQL, you have access to the underlying text. So that, that pipeline can be put into source code control, into GitHub. Or you can deploy it via CI CD system. You can use it with the CLI, maybe to move from developer to production. Or maybe you just want to email it to another team member to share. All of this allows you to avoid the typical trade-off of visual designers, where it's either extensible or it's easy to use. And it's also got this cool multi-user mode where two people can be editing the same pipeline at the same time. It's kind of like Google Docs for streaming data pipelines. But you know, I could talk and talk and talk about this, but a demo is worth a 1,000 slides. So please give it up for Megal from our team, and she and I are going to do a live demo. Megal. 
So the scenario we're going to have here is that Megal and I are colleagues at a, an online retailer. Uh, and so we have a lot of data pipelines that we use to run our business. Um, and Megal's actually going to, maybe you can start by just sort of giving us a, a tour of the canvas and show some of our pipelines here. Sure, sounds great, right. Um, so what do you all see here? It's our pipeline. And on the left-hand side, you'll see this source connector that connects the SQL Server database that I have to my Confluent Cloud. This connector writes to two topics, product stream and order stream. And if I move down to the right-hand side of the pipeline, you'll see that I've joined these two um, together. Um, so now that I have a stream that shows me in real time what are the products our customers are buying in our stores. But before I do this join, I need to do a couple of things first. Let's take a look at the orders stream and kind of get an idea of what the data looks like. So you can see that the orders are flowing through. Let's go ahead and expand one of them and take a look at the data. You see each event has an order ID, a product ID, customer ID, and purchase timestamp. Pretty standard things that you will have uh, in your orders table. Um, so now we know how it looks like. Um, let's move along. And the next thing is that we have this uh, product stream. So, but from this, I want to create a product table. So in KSQLDB, you can create a table that will always store the latest information for each um, product and row that you have. So for example, if the price of the product it changes, it's going to automatically change in the table. Nobody has to run anything to get the latest data. Now that I have the product table, I want to join the table to stream together, but they need to have uh, matching keys in order to do that. And for that, I have to rekey the order stream. So the uh, product ID is the primary key instead of the order ID. Pretty simple to do in KSQLDB. I do all of that, and then we can do the join. And now I have this um, uh, stream of data that is getting updated again in real time that has both the customer data, uh, the order data, and the product data in one place. This is great because now I can do a couple of things here. For example, let's say I wanted to filter for a specific product. I want to know if uh, a product is doing well across our store. Do we need to take any action on that? Do we need to talk with a vendor or anything like that? But we're not going to do that because I just got a very important email. So. so how many of you as data engineers have had a perfectly running pipeline, and then you get an alert from a department that rhymes with schmarketing, and they want you to do some more, some more additions? You're either raising your hand or you're not telling us the truth. Uh, so in this case, uh, marketing has decided that we don't want to just get orders. We actually want to know what web pages that user visited in the hour before buying the shoes. Now, at this point, Magel could go and build a new pipeline and, and try to build that from scratch, but I think Magel's got a shortcut. That's right. So I just use uh, our um, stream catalog here. So I, I think this clickstream data is probably have click in its name. So I'm just going to take that guess and search for click. And then you see a couple of these topics pop up under this result page. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to click on it and see what's available for me to use. And if I scroll here, you see a bunch of streams with different tags. Some of them are staging, some of them are prod, and some of them are development. I'm going to trust that I should use the prod one. I don't want to use somebody else's experiment that they're doing. So Probably a wise move. Right? So let's go ahead with Clickstream Global that is in my environment that has a um, tag of prod. Now that I landed here, on the right-hand side, you see some business metadata. It tells me who owns this stream of data, uh, how I can contact them, and some description about this data that exists. Now again, I feel confident that this is the right one that I picked. Let's go ahead and take a look at this schema. So if I expand this uh, schema properties, you see that each event that comes to this click stream has five different fields. And um, IP address, page URL, product ID, user ID, and view time. And IP address is correctly labeled with the PII tag. So again, feeling good about this. So let's go ahead and go back to the stream designer and add it to our canvas. And the way to do so, I'm just going to easily add, pick a component from the left-hand side. I'm going to click on Topic and add my topic to the canvas. Cool. So as she does this, she's choosing the, the topic she wants to add. And then she's going to do some of the standard configuration you do for a KSQL topic. Tell it the data format. In this case, she wants JSON um, and, and uh, the timestamp. Decide what columns from the stream she wants. And she clicks Save. Now, at this point, Megal has clicked Reactivate. Reactivate is, is sort of like pushing. 
It takes the changes you've made locally and it actually commits them into Confluent Cloud. Now this sometimes takes a few seconds because if you think about it, you're actually spinning up infrastructures and connectors and networking. So in this case, it's all done. So now we're ready to, to join this to our existing purchase uh, data. So you're gonna bring up the, uh, the join option? That's right, so I'm gonna start the join from my order stream. I'm gonna give this a name and then I'm gonna go ahead and configure this. And don't worry about the red box over there, that's just because I haven't finished configuring this. That's that validation we told you about. It's telling us that this item isn't yet complete and so it won't successfully push into production. And at this point, Megal's gonna use a drag and drop to connect the sources and she's gonna choose the type of join. It's all the things you, you'd expect to be able to do, inner versus outer. Um, she's going to choose how long that this uh, query should be. In this case, she's gonna look back one hour in the window. Um, and then she's gonna have a grace period because you know in streaming events, sometimes events come in out of sequence. So in this case, she's gonna use a one minute grace period. And again, we've added that component. Oops. The campus zooms. I know. It has, I think, AI. And then at the end of the day, we're gonna take this output and write it to a new Kafka topic so that other people in the organization have access to this information. And again, similar process of, of filling out some of the standard configuration options and then reactivate the pipeline. And again, these things are being pushed into production, infrastructure's being configured, networking, the, the data is actually being connected to start flowing in real time. And if we've appeased the demo gods, which you have, now we have our results. Let's go and check them out. Perfect, so we see again, they're populating, so now we see the stream has both the order information but also the customer information. So we know within the hour of purchase, uh, the item that they purchased, uh, they looked at other products, so now marketing can send these personalized email to them. Uh, but before we do that, I wanna show something else that is pretty cool, which is um, our code import. So. Everything we've been doing is on the, uh, has been on the UI, but that's not all, all of it. So I'm gonna pass it along to uh, Greg to talk about this. Right, so as Michael said, everything she's done so far has been the drag and drop UI, but behind the scenes there is the code view, which shows me the entire case SQL. But it's not just a read-only read view. In this case, Megal wants to write the resulting output to a MongoDB database. But rather than do a drag and drop, someone just sent her the text, here's the connection string for, the, for connecting to the Mongo database. So now she has uh, enabling read write view on this, on this pipeline. And I'm gonna scroll all the way to the end and add my MongoDB configuration here. And I'm gonna apply changes to this. This is gonna take the text and it's gonna interpret that and add the component to the canvas. So now there we have it. That, thank you so much, Megal. So we, yes, give it up for Megal. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks, Megal. Thank you for having me. So you saw there, we started with a visual tool to help make it easy to click and drag and drop. We had access to the stream catalog to make it easy to identify the data sources to be reused. And she could work in the tool of her choice, switching back and forth from a visual tool into, uh, into a text tool. Now the other thing Ta Chad talked about was stream governance. Now that it's easy to build pipelines, let's talk about how you can trust the data pipelines you have. We introduced stream governance last year to give you the ability to discover, understand, and trust your data streams. And we've seen great adoption, but we've also got really great feedback. And the biggest feedback we got was, this needs to be more powerful. We need more capabilities. That's why today we're introducing stream governance advanced, a new tier of stream governance that takes it to the next level. And it does this across all three pillars of stream governance. Let's start with stream quality, the first one Chad mentioned. This controls what data goes into what topics with schema registry. We've made schema registry more resilient, scalable, and available. In terms of resilient, we've taken the existing SLA and we've increased it from 99.5 to three and a half nines. That's a 10x reduction in downtime. We've taken, People don't like downtime, I'm with you. Uh, we've taken the limit on number of schemas from 1,000, we've blown that up to 20,000. So now you have much, the ability to store much more schemas in the registry. And because it's a cloud product, it needs to be available everywhere you are, we've made it from not just nine regions globally to 28 regions globally. 
Taken together, these three changes make schema registry much more capable of working at the scale that you need if you're gonna build your business around data pipelines. The second major pillar is stream catalog. You saw Megal showed that. This answers that question of how do I find what's out there? How do I find the streams that I wanna use? Well, we've done a couple things. You saw business metadata where you can customize and put whatever information your business needs. Maybe it's the contact information, maybe it's a department, maybe it's a cost center. All of this then helps you answer that question, is this the right stream that I should be building on? And because you sometimes wanna search not just via the command line or by the UI, we've added a GraphQL API. So you can programmatically build applications that analyze your, your stream catalog and help you understand the streaming data that you have in your organization. Stream lineage, of course, is the tool that lets you see end to end how a transformation is happening giving you a bird's eye view or a drill down. We've now added a feature that's sort of like having a time machine built in. It's the ability to see how a pipeline has evolved over time. Imagine it's Monday morning, you walk in and your stream's broken. Well, okay, somebody did something, but when? With stream lineage point in time, you can actually look back and find out who made the change, when and how. This all helps you be able to resolve and recover from errors and problems more quickly. Now, as cool as stream governance and stream lineage and stream designer are, these aren't the only features, and I could go on for hours, but we've got a show to get on. And so we've, there's many more features inside this release of Confluent Cloud. We've taken our serverless clusters and increased the scalability and throughput on them. We've added a new networking option for Google Cloud customers, so you now have private networking support. So if you want to find out more about any of these, there's three things you can do. You can go out in the booth there and you can get a live demo of stream design yourself and get your hands on it and try it. If you're not already a Confluent Cloud customer, you can sign up for a free trial. There's no credit card required and you can get an extra $400 credit as well. And most importantly, talk to us. We have hundreds of Confluent engineers and product folks here today. They want to hear from you about what's working well, what's not, what can we do to help make streaming data easier and more pervasive in your organization. Those are the conversations we live for. And speaking of conversations, I'm delighted to now be able to bring up our president of field operations, Erica Schultz, and the vice president of software engineering for New Relic, Andrew Hartnett, to talk about how we are working together to help make streaming data available for everybody. So Erica and Andrew, come on up. Well, good morning. It's great to be here and wonderful to hear from Chad and Greg and others this morning. Um, I'm thrilled to be joined by Andrew Hartnett, Vice President of Engineering at New Relic this morning. So welcome. Thank you for being here. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Andrew Hartnett, I'm the VP of Engineering at New Relic. I run our core data platform group and the platform is the platform by which we ingest all of our data and make it available for customers for query and, and other products. Um, it's great to be here in Austin. You know, I live in San Antonio, about an hour south of here. Um, Austin and San Antonio have this awesome sort of symbiotic relationship. Um, one area we don't agree though is about breakfast tacos. Um, I'm here to say it emphatically, San Antonio created the breakfast taco. There it is. <laughs> so, but glad to be here. I love it. That's great. Hopefully that's the most controversial statement that's made all day, right? Um, well, for anyone in the audience who's not familiar with New Relic, can you share a little bit about what New Relic does? Sure. So we're, uh, we're an observability company. And our goal is to enable developers, operations folks, you know, SRE teams, um, security personnel, uh, you know, PMs, anybody in the business to make decisions based off of data and not opinion. In order to do that, you know, we ingest massive amounts of data from around the world, you know, think mobile devices, browsers, um, all major clouds, um, your own data centers, you know, this and that. All of that is sending data through to us so that we can turn around and make that data available. That's fantastic. And I know you deliver incredibly mission critical value to your customers. How does Confluent fit into New Relic's architecture? Well, I'm gonna steal a phrase from Jay. Um, 
For us, Kafka is our central nervous system. It is a part of everything that we do. Um, most services in some way, shape, or form across 110 different engineering teams, you know, with thousands of services, touch Kafka in some way, shape, or form within our company. So it really is mission critical. You know, we, what we were looking for is, is the ability to grow. We were coming up against some really sort of, you know, hard, choices that we were going to have to make when we were running Kafka ourselves in our own data center. Um, we had already had a relationship with Confluent, and so you know, we just continued the conversation to get to where we are now. Yeah, and I know that you were running Kafka yourselves for many years. Can you tell us more about what sparked the shift to sure. Confluent Cloud? You know, there, there was a time at New Relic, one of the rallying cries was, you know, we have the largest single Kafka cluster in the world. and um, you know, personally, that's not something I would put on a resume, but it's, it's where we ended up, and that got us into trouble. We, we needed to get out of our own data center. We physically could not grow our Kafka cluster. We couldn't upgrade it without major sort of reliability impacts across the board affecting all of our products. And so we chose to, to solve this by going to the cloud. Um, and that's where we started having these first conversations about Confluent Cloud. So that's a massive shift. Can you tell us more about what gave you confidence in Confluent in the technology and in us as a partner to, uh, to move to Confluent from Kafka? Right. Well, it's, it started with the relationship. You know, we, um, we are a very Kafka-centric company, and so being able to have these sort of deep technical, technical conversations with folks from Confluent right away put us at ease. Um, the fact that, you know, um, Jay and, and others that, that helped sort of drive Kafka in the first place, the understanding of what it means to bring a service um, and make that reliable, you know, all these things sort of come, came together. Um, also looking at the, you know, Confluent Cloud itself, the list of features, the things that we wanted to go do that we couldn't do currently with our setup because of, of where we were. Um, all, all of those sort of played into our, our factor, our, our, our decision making. The, the other couple things that came into play was you know, total cost of ownership. You know, when, when we are running or when you're running massive scale Kafka and needing it to be up and reliable, it takes people, it takes hands on keyboard, it takes monitoring, and you know, that, that adds up. What we would rather do, though, is have those same engineers, instead of having to watch this and, and maintain and monitor and operate, we would like to put them to you know, work on customer-facing features that would bring value to our customers versus uh, being, being uh, you know, beholden to Kafka. That's great. Um, you know, Chad spoke earlier this morning about uh, the five principles of better data pipelines, streaming, decentralized, governed, declarative, and developer-oriented. And I'm wondering, for New Relic, or for you, is there one or two of those five that resonates the most? I think probably streaming and decentralized. Um, decentralized actually means a lot of things. Um, I'll start with that, but one of the other, the other plays that we had going on was, you know, we are multi-cloud. We want to be where our customers are. We want to be in those same environments. We want to be in those same regions. And we wanted to have our Kafka there with us. And so we needed a product that was able to go into all of those major environments. Um, and, and, you know, Confluent Cloud hit that for us. Um, the other way sort of decentralization um, hits with me is some of the new products that are coming out. The stream designer is very, very interesting. Uh, I mentioned we have lots of Kafka expertise at New Relic, um, but we also are hiring and growing and expanding, and um, the entry point for an engineer to be able to use something like Stream Designer, I think is very, very interesting and compelling to just say, hey, here's a good starting point. Go start investigating. Look and see what your architecture actually looks like. Um, on the streaming side, obviously, um, you know, we stream everything. We're streaming um, all of our data continuously. As we're having this conversation, I think we've already ingested, you know, 25 uh, billion data points. Uh, but 
customers for us. We want a combination of like, I need to know right now, and so the queries that they're pulling is against live data and streaming data, and we have others that are we're looking for more historical, but we need to be able to offer, uh, give them both options. That's great. No, that's, that's helpful to hear. You mentioned Stream Designer, obviously a big announcement from Confluent. Um, and I know you're thinking of a couple different use cases for Stream Designer for your organization. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so there, there was the, uh, what I just discussed, which is you know, new people, new people to Kafka. I think this is a great entry. It's a great way to sort of start visually designing some things. Um, I think also there's another set of users in there, maybe along, more along the line of product managers that can use something like that to go and investigate. Is, you know, if I'm putting together a new um, customer-facing product, where am I going to get the data from? Does it already exist? Something like Stream Designer might be, you know, a good tool for them to start that investigation. Um, and then the other actually uh, came about recently. I was demoed uh, Stream Designer, and it immediately my eye went to something that I thought looked a little strange. Um, and it was a, a service that was going back and forth and back and forth between some topics, like six, seven times. And it's just a, you know, sometimes I use the smell test. And to me, I was like, huh, that looks a little interesting. What is that? Um, you know, Slack, the owner of that service. And two weeks later, that service has been cleaned up. And, uh, you know, each one of these hops in and out of Kafka for us in, for us in the cloud, you know, costs money. Cloud isn't free, by the way. And so using it as a tool also to just uh, get a better understanding of your existing systems and to uh, look for things like uh, COGS reductions where you can. That's great. That's powerful. Well, what's next for data streaming at New Relic? And do you have any words of advice for the audience? Well, next for us is more massive growth. Um, you know, we are, we're on, I think we're on, uh, track for about you know, two and a half to three exabyte that we will be ingesting, um, all of that flowing through uh, Kafka and then Confluent Cloud. Um, I would say that you know, we're, we're definitely in the data age, right? We've been in this for a while. Um, I think there are, are lots of, of companies out there that are somewhere sort of on the adoption curve for Kafka. Um, we are, we're a little further advanced, you know, we've been, um, We've been using Kafka, I think, for eight years now. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a year and a half ago, I upgraded uh, a version. Uh, I think we were on .10.2, a five-year-old version of Kafka. So we've been, we've been there. We've been in the trenches. Um, but there are lots that are still just sort of jumping in. Um, I think that the collection of tools that Confluent has, and specifically Confluent Cloud, for those that, are, that want that sort of single pane of glass across all environments, um, is, is huge. Uh, I think uh, a lot of us are looking at you know, multi-cloud strategies. Um, I think there's, uh, there's also some, you know, we didn't talk about uh, uh, governance, but governance is also a huge play, especially if you're starting off into it. Um, we were a little bit already in and had our own sort of tools developed, but uh, I'm excited about what's coming up. That's fantastic. We're, we are thrilled to be partnering with you. So thank you so much. And thank you for joining us today. Yep, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome back to the stage, Danica and Chris. Thank you. Our last job as MCs, and let's begin by thanking New Relic for being part of this. That was fantastic. Absolutely. They, oh yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're an amazing Kafka user. I've spoken to them on the podcast, and they just do things at an astonishing scale, you know, petabytes without breaking a sweat. It's absolutely wild. And you know what? They've been such a great partner for Confluent that I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of that collaboration. And seeing what comes in the future, right? Yeah, absolutely. What about Streams Designer? Streams Designer is My part God. of the future now. That's going to be great. I, you know, the thing about something like Streams Designer is it opens up the ideas we've been talking about to so many more people. You know, you're not, you're not going to take Emacs away from me. <laughs> I'm not going to stop programming. But the kind of people that we work with all the time, and the people that are new to this, this field, they're going to find that's the way they can onboard themselves with these ideas and get something working fast. So I think that's great. 
great for accessibility. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as developer relations people, a big part of our job is making these ideas accessible to more people. So, thanks to Streams show. Designer, I think we could take next week off, right? <laughs> <laughs> We've earned it, well, honest. We have. We're absolutely going to need next week off, but <laughs> just one week, Chris. You just one, week. one week. Just one week. Because as That'll soon be as we get back, we have to hit the ground running, planning for next year's Currents. Current right? 23. We're excited for that. Yes? Okay. We are excited. <laughs> And I would like to personally extend an invite to each and every one of you to join us right here next year. So, Looking in, forward to it. Absolutely. And until then, get on out there and enjoy the rest of your current. We'll see you around. Thank you.